Hey guys, before we get started today, I just want to make a special announcement that it is officially Hot Girl Summer. That's right, you guys have asked for them, and we are delivering. We have crop tops available in a brand new merch store. Uh, thanks to the hard work of Jane Carmichael and Emily Baker, we are going to have crop tops, muscle tees, and all sorts of other fun merchandise. The link is going to be in the show notes and at TrivialityPodcast.com. And now let's get on with the show. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil, and I'm sitting next to you, Jeff. Very, very close. (laughs) How are you doing today? Closer than usual. Maybe a little too close for comfort. I feel like we're in the scene from Superbad uh, when Jonah Hill rolls over next to Michael Sarah. Boop. You're right on top of me. Well, no better place to be, really. That's what they say. Or maybe no one says that. Who Ken, says that? Ken, how are <laughs> you? I, I certainly haven't said it. <laughs> I think Neil said it. Yeah, you and, haven't. And maybe I said it. Ken, you had a, a, a scary situation today where you were just thrown into to work. We we're all ready to go. Yeah, and then I had to run off, try to do a delivery. And then the delivery was canceled, so I was halfway there, and then I got back. Yeah. Right. Big pain in the butt. And then you told your boss, like Michael Jordan in The Last Dance, you said, I took that personally. I said, I quit. Yeah. And then, no, yeah. I didn't quit. Threw your arms up. I uh, can't quit yet. Well, you, I can't quit you either. Matt, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Not quitting my job either. So we're all, uh, we're all not quitters is what it sounds like. Well, that's good, because I don't know if Matt knows this, but I've been secretly siphoning off his bank account to, to support my lifestyle. So yeah. <laughs> Speaking of not quitting, um, <laughs> you recently um, were preparing episode 211 for posting. And I was like, holy crap, this is well over a week of content. Pretty cool. Like, So if you started our podcast mm-hmm. and you, you just let it play through a week later, about maybe it a little still longer, wouldn't be done. it would still be going. And if anybody wants to do that, we could use listen. So, isn't that what the Bare Naked Lady song is about? Yeah, it's been. Yeah, and it's just about listening to our podcast mm-hmm. for a week straight, even though it didn't exist when they wrote the song, but they knew what was going <laughs> they on. Did. They did. In fact, actually, every lyric in that song is referenced somewhere in a triviality episode. So you just got to pay attention to those clues. So listen to if every you find episode them all, again. We will yeah. send you a T-shirt. And yeah, I think that's how it works. It's like Pokemon. You got to find them all. Um, Somebody's about to be very disappointed. <laughs> yes. Well, we do have a special guest here who's going to be hosting today. Uh, it is a classic triviality game uh, just with us four. Uh, and we uh, thought there could be no better way to celebrate that than by inviting a special guest into the studio through the internet uh, over the airwaves. He's actually uh, fighting crime in Chattanooga right now, but he's originally from Toronto. He's a Dutch enthusiast on Patreon, and we appreciate his support. And that is Ken Ludlow. How are you, Ken? I'm very well, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, maybe what got you into trivia? Sure. I, uh, I, I'm a project manager. Um, I live in Toronto, uh, but I travel quite a bit for work. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee this week. Um, so that keeps me pretty busy. Uh, I get into trivia um, a while ago, actually, when I was in Chicago. I kind of stumbled into a bar next to a hotel, and they happened to be hosting uh, a trivia night um, there. So I kind of caught on out of the blue and then kind of kept up to it. So I travel quite a bit all over the country, and whenever I do, I seek out different places that are holding a trivia night nearby. And uh, I usually travel with some coworkers, and we'll you know, uh, grab a few of them and, and head out and, and make a night of it. So awesome. Been doing that quite so, a bit, yeah. so he's not uh, fighting crime, at least not on the books. Not on the books, right? I have never seen Ken and Batman in the same room, though. So That is correct. And I don't think uh, Batman's... Or, or Banksy. Well, Batman's accountant never has receipts for any of the things he does because mm-hmm. then he'd get taxed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ken, you said uh, you got into trivia in Chicago, which is a nice connection to us over here. Uh, I, I'm just curious, the bar that you walked into... Did you like walk in and there was a mustache man who just said, next category, Italian sausage and peppers. <laughs> like, it's a weird trivia not, game. Uh, not quite, no. And honestly, if you asked me what bar it was, I'd have no idea. It was next to a Best Western, but I wouldn't even... Oh, I mean, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah sure. I, I know that bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Best Western. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken watches all of the best yeah. games there. Is that an old style sign that said it didn't even have a name? Those yeah, are the best right. bars. Yeah. 
Uh, well, Ken is going to be hosting for us today. He put together a game, so we just have to figure out who's playing who. Um, Ken, you said that you've been playing with Jeff a, lo- a Qu- lot. Quite recently. a bit recently, so I, I thought I'd take Neil today. And uh, since there's two Kens, I thought today would be the Ken Lander, because there can be only one. All right, so we'll be Ken Lander, and I guess I'll be the um, Sean Connery. You'll be the um, Michael, uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his last name. Oh, uh, what? The actor from Highlander. Oh, that guy who played Raiden? Raiden. I'm oh, play- forget him. <laughs> Chris, no, Christopher. Christopher Lambert. Christopher Lambert. I don't know. I was thinking of Michael Lambert for some reason. Anyway. All right. We'll be Ken Lander. Jeff. Ken? Jeff, I mean, Matt. Ken, Ken Matt. <laughs> Jeff Matt. Jeff Matt. Take three. Ken? Ken? <laughs> Jeff? Neil? Ken? Yeah, we're just saying a bunch of names. All right. Jeff and Matt? Yeah, we're... Obviously, we're going to be uh, Christopher Lambert and Ernie. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Who are these people? So Christopher Lambert and Ernie uh, versus Ken Lander. And uh, Ken, our host, uh, any preference on the rules read? Oh, I think uh, we'll get the, the rules guy, but see if he can do it in Canadian for me. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. I am the cream of the crop, and don't forget it, Dutch boy. That's a that's a skill. A little bit of French in there, a little bit of apology. All right. Well, without further ado, why don't we jump on into this game? All right, guys. Round one, question one. In Dr. Seuss's holiday classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, for how many years, plus or minus two, has the Grinch had to put up with all that noise, 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 noise that the Who's make while celebrating Christmas? So my only plan of attack on this one, Neil, is to figure out if it rhymes with something, which I don't know. Do you know? Uh, I don't know. Um, what was the quote from the book you said, Ken? Sixty. It, I don't know about sixty. Three. All right. Well, maybe like. How maybe, do you know? You do you know how Grinch's age? I I would say he's he's definitely middle aged. He's an adult. He's he's the, sort of the All demographic right, let's say that. Thirty three. Okay, that's fine. Thirty three. Because I don't know. All right. I uh, I don't know offhand. I was thinking thirty ish years, but I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's at least forty. Forty. I think he's, I think he's been pretty pretty pissed for a long time. <laughs> okay. You want to go? Uh, you want to go like forty? Forty two? Yeah. This is forty two. Forty two. It is. I have on good authority. It only takes thirty three years to get that crunchy. But Ken, what's the answer? Uh, the answer is 53. Wow. For 53 years, he's put up with it now. I had that, that three in my head. Yeah, I, I guess just... I was thinking of the Jim Carrey movie where he's younger, but in, the, I guess, the cartoon, he's like an old man. He's 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 a Grinch. Yeah. You don't know how Grinches age. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's a good point. Yoda is 400. You wouldn't have guessed that, probably. Well, he's got a great... Baby Yoda is 50. Yeah, we don't know anything about their physiology, because apparently hypertrophic cardiomyopathy doesn't immediately kill them, so... There you oh, go. my God. They just have good, good makeup, that's all. All right. Question two. Uh, the title of which musical, which opened on Broadway in 2017, refers to a term used by natives of the Canadian province of Newfoundland to refer to visitors from outside the island? Yeah, I got it. Oh, Twenty seventeen Broadways. Uh, did you did you see any of them? No. <laughs> the only the no, only show I saw twenty sixteen was Hamilton, and I never saw okay. that on Broadway. I didn't have the privilege of flying to New York and getting a ticket. Uh, I believe I had to give mine up for o- the Obamas. So they, they had it in Chicago. Yeah, they did have it in Chicago, but I never made it around to that. Once again, reason. though, it was all Chicago accents. After the war, <laughs> all right. not gonna miss my shot. <laughs> Uh, You're not throwing away a shot? Two, two tree shots. That's all you get. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we don't know, right? 
Yeah, no, I don't I don't remember what this is. I'm sure I've heard it at some point, but Yeah, Bon Voyage. They're French, right? I think. <laughs> yeah, this musical has a really pretty score. Uh we went with Come From Away. And the answer is Come From Away. I actually uh I grew up in Newfoundland and I was born in Gander, Newfoundland, where the uh the musical was set. Oh, that's so really cool. It was cool. a story of uh just after September 11, 2001, when uh, you know all the planes were grounded, that's right. Thirty-eight planes that uh, that were stuck there for like five days or something. So there's a town of eleven thousand people, and there was seven thousand stranded passengers. Wow! I'll have to check that one out. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. All right, number three. What is the largest body of water in the British Isles by volume? It has more water than all the lakes in England and Wales combined. All right, we have uh, kind of a weird idea, so we're going to go ahead and lock in here. They have weird ideas. Do you have any ideas? Yeah. if it, it When I think about in the British Isles, I don't know if the surrounding waters count. I mean, if they don't, and we're looking something in the British Isles, he didn't say anything about Scotland, I don't think. So I think of Loch Ness as possibly a really deep lake. Maybe it contains a lot of water that way. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Loch Ness. I just, this is what made me think of, sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know uh, how you feel about that answer, but. I love Loch Ness. I think let's go for it. Okay. Old Nessie. Perfect. We will lock in Loch Ness. Yeah, I figured it got to be pretty big to contain that monster. So, you know, it barely comes out to a uh, surface, so it's got to be hiding somewhere in there. So Loch Ness. Loch Ness is correct. Yeah. Did you see the scientific sort of videos they've been releasing lately uh, talking about how the Loch Ness Monster was probably thought to have uh, existed where it's whales, um, uh, what, what do you want to call it? Their members coming up out of the water <laughs> and it, the way that it curves, it looks like the head of the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, I always do that when I'm in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> you do the old... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, the periscope, the whale move, periscope yeah, move, yeah. yeah. How's that work out for you? <laughs> so far, not so good. Yeah, he's gotten thrown out of a, a lot times, of yeah. pools. That's probably why that you're you're not allowed at the Best Western that Ken went to to get go to trivia for. All right. Yeah. All right. Question four: What sea word is a term used for animals or creatures such as the Loch Ness monster that some people believe to be real, but scientific evidence of their existence has yet to be found? Merriam-Webster notes that the term was first used in 1983. For the Mothman, I think. Oh, do you know this? I do know this. Nice. One of my favorite genres of things. I will let you lock in. So, conspiracy, creature. I'm sure this is going to, like, pop out, like, just like a whale and... uh... No, no (laughs) more of this. Get in a pool. Um, no, I'm sure it's going to pop out once we hear it, but I, I, let's just say conspiracy. I like that. Mm. When you watch a lot of, uh, YouTube videos on nonsense, like Bigfoot Yeti and the Jersey devil, most of them have cryptid in the, uh, title. Oh. So I believe these are cryptids. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. Cryptid. Um, you can go to a website, uh, of- Crypt, crypt wiki page has a whole list of crazy things that apparently people seem to think may exist, like a rhinoceros dolphin or a bat squatch, whatever that might be. So some of you guys may know that I used to work at a zoo in a um, in a very small capacity, but um, I was manning the phones for the whole zoo one time, and uh, somebody called in and said. Hey, I got a question for you guys about an animal that I saw, but it's a little funny. I go, well, well, what kind of animal? He's like, it was like a big dog, but it didn't have any hair, and it had like a big head. I was like, sir, are you describing the chupacabra? And he said, yeah, I didn't want to say it, but yeah, I saw the chupacabra. (laughs) I was like, I got nothing, man. I got nothing. True story. (laughs) Was it you, Jeff? (laughs) Neil, you weren't supposed to tell him. <laughs> All right. Question five is uh, somewhat of a listener supplied question. This one comes from my daughter, who is uh, almost 10 years old. What paradoxically named animal is the largest fish in the sea? Mm. Oh, uh, I know, Matt. Okay. Okay. So if we're talking about a paradox. Um, it's probably not named like it's a fish. 
But sharks are fish, and whale shark might be the way to go here because whales are not fish. Oh, right, right. So but whale sharks are. Whale sharks are. Okay. I mean, if I guess that is a paradox, yeah. So we'll say the whale shark. I've always wanted to go swimming with them. Um, I believe this is the whale shark. The whale shark is correct. My daughter fancies herself an animal expert. So. What's your daughter's name? Great question. Uh, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia, for that wonderful question. And it brings us to our first score update. Looks like both teams are at 30 points. Moving on to question six. A video game character was introduced in 1985 and has been included in many lists ranking the greatest video game villains of all time. A recent Netflix series had made some changes to the backstory, however, making the character a hero. Yeah, this is really tough. I, I'm trying to think of 85 villains. All I think of is like Donkey Kong, the ghost from Pac-Man, um, Bowser. All right. We are really stuck on this. Do you want to say Donkey Kong, even though I don't think there's a Netflix series? Sure. Yeah, we'll just say Donkey Kong. Um, so Jeff, I'm pretty sure that there is a Castlevania anime. Um, I don't know if the villain there is Alucard. Um, and I think he might be on that list. Do you think that that might be something? Alucard is the name of a vampire, but I don't I think he's know. the villain in Castlevania. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay. How, Locked in Alucard. How dumb can I be? I think it's probably Dracula, but. The answer I was going for actually is Carmen San Diego. Oh, <laughs> oh, forgot about that one. Oh, yeah, man. Netflix series is actually really good. I've been watching that with my daughter. So, well. so that character came from a video game first. It came from a video oh, game yeah. first. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. I never knew that. A computer I didn't know game, she was probably. a villain. Yeah, she steals. And goes she around the, oh stuff. yeah, I guess she so. goes to Chattanooga and then Toronto. So she's and then Chicago. <laughs> she's like the original Thomas Crown. The Carmen San Diego affair. Carmen San Diego stopped in Chattanooga and stole their um, what what else? Choo choo. Their choo choo. Yeah. <laughs> their chili. What do they have there? <laughs> I just used to tune in to Carmen San Diego to watch Rockapella. Oh, Rockapella, Rock classic. Yeah, I saw them live once at Chuba's Tavern. I believe that a hundred percent. Yeah, I was so close to them. I I was getting the spit from the beatboxer on my face. Mm. That's got to be your best memory. That's it. You peaked. <laughs> All right. Question number seven. What is the last name of brothers George, Charles, and Edward, whose company trademarked the name Ping Pong in the U.S. in the early 1900s when they introduced table tennis to Americans? Through World War I and the 1920s, they focused on producing wooden jigsaw puzzles, and the company also introduced the Nerf Ball in 1969, starting that line of toys. Okay. I mean, I like your answer, too, though, so. I, I think yours is good. All right, we'll we'll give it a shot. We'll we'll lock in with our answer. Uh, Nerf is by Mattel, I think. Okay, the only other one I could think of is Hasbro, and I don't know if that's like the Has Ooh. Brothers or something, but Hasbro is good. Now I'm confused. I know. Sorry. I don't know. What do you want to go with, Mattel? Yeah, we can go with Mattel. Okay. All right, we're taking the one with brothers right in the name and saying Parker Brothers. And Parker Brothers is correct. Ah. Nice. Question number eight. Quixotry is a word defined as acting in a way that is inspired by romantic beliefs without regard for reality. Scrabble player Michael Cresta played the word Quixotry in a match in 2006 that, at the time, was a record for the most points from a single word in a sanctioned Scrabble event in North America. It scored him what timely number of points? All right, we'll, we'll lock in here with a little little bit of a guess. Well, timely, so maybe something to do with the clock. I was thinking of maybe possibly a date that's romantic, like 214. Mm, that, that would be romantic. It's a lot of points, okay. but... It has a lot of points, maybe, but, uh, you know... Unless We're you want to go with it. the other romantic joke answer, which is hey. about a third of those points. <laughs> All right. You're going with nice. Valentine's Day. Uh, we just thought it was timely because it was the same amount of points as the year it was in. So we said 2006 <laughs> points, which is a lot of points. You'd have to hit at least three triple triple word scores for that. But 
Uh, the answer to that one is 365. Oh. Uh, so, so, so right in the middle of yeah. our two guesses. <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah, That's right, right in the middle. Question number nine. The skull is made up of two parts, the cranium and the facial bones. How many bones make up the skull, plus or minus one? Note, I'm not including the hyoid bone or the ear bones in my count. Thank God. So the skull bone's <laughs> connected to the jaw bone. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we'll go with your answer. Now, yeah, there's there, there's a lot of bones in the eyes region, isn't there? There's the orbital bone and the a whole bunch of occipital the... bone or something. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's at least like nine or ten, right? I want to make it a nice round number. Isn't ten a nice round number? That's what I was saying. Would you, oh, would you okay. want to make it that as opposed to nine? You know, we could say I would, ten. I would like I would like to make it that. <laughs> we'll say ten. <laughs> We're saying uh, six, just on a whim. The answer is actually 22. Wow. So there are nice eight cranial number. bones and 14 facial bones. Nice well, us Neanderthals round. only have about 10 or 11, I think. <laughs> that works. Question number 10. Uh, baseball player Neil Walker played for the Pittsburgh Pirates from 2009 to 2015. His father, Tom Walker, also played in the major leagues as a pitcher. On December 31st, 1972, Tom was luckily persuaded not to board a plane that crashed just after takeoff and took the life of what other Pittsburgh Pirates legend? R.I.P. We can lock in. Yes, I figured as much. It's got to be uh, Roberto Clemente, I would think, because he's the only pi Pirates legend I can even think of, and I can really only name one. Dude, I have no idea here. He's mm. the most famous Pirate. It's not the guy other than Black that Bear. he already Black said Bear. in the question, right? <laughs> No, no, the guy he said in the question, I've never even heard of. Uh, his dad? But his dad, Roberto Clemente, was huge in the 60s. He's the best Pittsburgh Pirate of all time. Um, and I, I knew he, I think he died early. So right. no, let's do it then. Okay, we're going to lock in with Roberto Clemente. Most famous Pirate besides Blackbeard. Well, the reason I'm saying that is because in Chicago, we have a high school named after Roberto Clemente. So he must have been famous enough to get a random high school in Chicago named after him. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Neil Walker spells his name correctly with the N I E L. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure they're correct. It's uh, Roberto Clemente. That's right. It's Roberto Clemente. After the first round, it looks like Team Ken Lander and Team Christopher Lambert, and I forget what else your name said. And Ernie. And Bert and Ernie. Oh, and Ernie. Oh, that's right. Sesame Street. Uh, we're all tied at fifty. <laughs> so uh, pretty even game here. Uh, you got us playing, uh, Ken. So what do you have in store for the swing round? For the swing round, I have a list of movies, TV shows, and a couple of other different things. Uh, I'm going to list uh, the movie or the, the show, and I want you to let me know what person narrated. Sounds good. The, the real life person. I'm not looking for a character or anything, but the, the, the actor or, oh, okay. or whatever. Okay. Maybe. Number one, movie uh, Stand By Me from 1986. Number two, the movie The Royal Tannenbaums from 2001. Number three, the TV show The Wonder Years from 1988 to 1993. Number four, the TV show Arrested Development from 2003 to 2019. Number five, the TV show Thomas the Tank Engine. So I'm talking about the U.S. version from 1984 to 1995. Number six, the movie Winnie the Pooh, the 2011 animated version. Number seven, the documentary March of the Penguins from 2005. Number eight, the audiobook version of Heartburn, the debut novel by director Nora Ephron. And the novel was published in 1983. Number nine, the audiobook version of the novel Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. The novel was published in 2011. And number 10, the movie Apocalypse Now in 1979. All right, we have uh, these questions, so we will consider these, and we'll be right back. All of the answers are now locked in, and we wanted to take a quick moment to thank Ken once again for being a Patreon supporter. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, not me. No, not the other Ken. Oh, right. Uh, our, our Chattanooga slash Toronto. Thank fan. me for nothing. Yeah, thank you for nothing. Thank Ken for everything. Okay. Uh, so Ken is a Patreon supporter. He's a Dutch enthusiast, uh, and we couldn't uh, do this without him. If you'd like to join him, you can go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. And uh, what what will we do for people, Jeff? Uh, foot massages? Definitely not me. Probably you guys. But no, uh, back not massages? On the table. No, I will not touch people with my hands. Sorry, Neil. All right. What if you wore gloves? Still. 
Okay. Well, that one time that we we put a body in acid, we had gloves on. It was okay. Shh, we're not. So, there are some things, Neil, that are just supposed to be between podcasters. So uh, what can people get if they join on Patreon? We have, I think the best thing is probably a lot of audio content. A lot of audio content. Uh, well over 30, maybe 40 hours even now. More I don't even this. know. Yeah, if you want more of this. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if you like the crap that we put out here, you're going to love the crap we put on Patreon. A mega crap. What a great tagline. Come get your <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Great tagline. Well, um, yeah, please join Ken uh, by going to patreon.com slash triviality podcast. And Ken, I'm going to throw it back to you, but I do have a quick question. Out of these 10 examples you gave of movies and TV shows, if you could only have one for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, I don't know. It would probably have to be Winnie the Pooh. Great answer. Yeah. You couldn't watch that over and over again. Great I answer. I agree. Yeah. But the real, the real question is, who would you like to narrate your life? What about Winnie the Pooh himself? No. I can't. I can't do a Winnie the Pooh. Arrested accent. Development. Yeah, I'd have run hard Arrested in a heartbeat. Yeah. Sorry, not Winnie the Pooh. Uh, <laughs> number four. Over, overruled. <laughs> All right. Well, shall we dig into these? Let's do it. All right. Number one was uh, the movie Stand by Me uh, from 1986. We went Richard Dreyfus. We also went with Richard Dreyfus. And the answer is Richard Dreyfus. And number two was the movie The Royal Tannenbaums from 2001. Yeah, we think this is not a cast member of the movie, but probably one of the Wes Anderson uh, regulars. So we said Jeff Goldblum because he's got the best voice. Yeah, we didn't know for sure, but we just guessed Bill Murray. The answer to this one is actually Alec Baldwin. Oh. oh. Not a Wes Anderson regular. Yeah, that's not kind of an off-kilter choice for him. Mm-hmm. Number three, TV show The Wonder Years from 1988 to 1993. I surprised Ken with this one. He didn't he didn't know this one, but it's kind of a fun trivia fact. Uh, I always find you, it fascinating. What do you think about it, Neil? It kind of sticks in your brain, if you know what I mean. One of the wet bandits. <laughs> it is one of the wet bandits uh, himself, Daniel Joe Stern. <laughs> when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, I got into a lot of scraps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like food scraps? Uh, we, yes, we also said Daniel Stern. We'll end that. <laughs> Daniel Stern is correct. Number four, TV show Arrested Development from 2003 to 2019. Yep. Uh, one of the easier ones for us, we said Ron Howard. Bum, ba, da, 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 da. Yep, we said Ron Howard. Ron Howard is correct. Number five, television show Thomas the Tank Engine. And I'm talking about the U.S. version from 1984 to 1995. Yeah, we know Ringo Starr has a connection to this. He might be the conductor guy. I think he's a conductor guy, and you or may you may call it an all star a... connection. Mm. Uh, he might be on another show too, but we said Ringo Starr. Uh, we also went with Ringo Starr, and the answer was George Carlin. Uh, oh, I was going to say uh, George Carlin. I thought it was completely wrong. I should have said it. That was my bad. I thought right. Carlin took over for him, but yeah, Ringo Starr did the before that. So George Carlin took over from Ringo Starr for the U.S. version in in 84 oh wow i didn't follow the advice of all the great trivia players we've met who've been on the show including ken of just you know say your gut answer and if it's wrong at least say it out loud yep number six uh the 2011 animated version of the movie winnie the pooh yeah we really didn't know on this one so we just assumed uh pooh was going into new trees exploring for new uh beehives and we said leonard nimoy um no, I believe that um, this was after Winnie the Pooh ran into the knights that say knee. We said John Cleese. And the answer is John Cleese. How'd you know that one? I kind of remembered a, like an advert for it. An advert? An advert. Oh yes. God. An advertisement? An advertisement, yes. God. Number seven, the documentary March of the Penguins from 2005. Yeah, we went uh, Morgan Freeman. Classic. Uh, yes, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, that one is a classic. Uh, Morgan Freeman is correct. Number eight, the audiobook version of Heartburn, the debut novel by director Nora Ephron. Uh, the novel was published in 1983. This one gave me a lot of trouble. I'm a big Nora Ephron fan. I know the book. I know it's about like um, divorce or marriage breaking up or something. Oh, I, Heartburn. Heartburn, yeah. And I couldn't remember. I always think that she's married to Rob Reiner, but I think Rob Reiner actually was married to Penny Marshall for a while, and I always mix those two up. But um, I couldn't remember who the narrator was. We said Rob Reiner, and then I remember, you know, Carrie Fisher wrote a bunch of books, and then I got confused because Meryl Streep played Carrie Fisher in the book about Carrie Fisher's life. 
So I didn't know if it was Meryl Streep or Carrie Fisher, and I just said Carrie Fisher. And you've like questioned and sept to yourself? Yes. Um, but funny you should mention uh, Rob Reiner and Penny Marshall because we just guessed Penny Marshall. And once again, Neil, you should have went with your gut answer, maybe. But the answer was Meryl Streep. She actually starred in the movie version of the novel. Oh, that's what I'm. That's why I'm thinking of it. And who was the the male lead in that? Because I think that's what's screwing me up. It was Jack Nicholson, wasn't it? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. I don't know. Something's got to give. If it was, I'm just going to leave for the rest of the episode because I should have known that. All right. Number nine was the audiobook version of the novel Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. And uh, the novel was published in 2011. Yep, I uh, love the first book, just finished the second book, and I know that uh, Will Wheaton is the narrator. Mm. I figured this guy was just so in love with the book, he wanted to make it a movie after narrating this. We said Spielberg. And the answer is Will Wheaton. It was Jack Nicholson audience, for the record, and see you later. <laughs> Neil's out. And the last one, number 10, the movie Apocalypse Now from 1979. I know Martin Sheen was the, uh, the star of this, and I think think it was narrated from his perspective so we just said martin sheen yeah i think this one's pretty obscure but we just guessed orson wells so the movie was uh the narrator was from the perspective of martin sheen's character however apparently uh at the time they went to record the voiceover there was some issue between him and a answered ford coppola so they got martin sheen's brother joe estevez to do the mm. narration for that. Mm. Wow. Great fact. Looks like both teams are going to be picking up 25 points, which means, kids, the score isn't changed, except it's gone up, but it's the same. So it's 75 to 75. So the, the margin hasn't inflation. changed. The score has. <laughs> the score's changed. The margin hasn't, but the attitude is very peachy right now. All right. Well, we'll move on to round two. Question number one. Which company's first product was also the first product to raise over $10 million in pledges on the website Kickstarter in 2012? The products were shuttered and the company sold in 2016, even though another project it created was the first to raise $20 million on Kickstarter in 2015. I think I heard a clue in there. And I, I don't know if this brand started on Kickstarter, but if the clue is what I'm thinking it is, then I think it makes sense. When I think of successful Kickstarters, I remember that that fancy uh, cooler that that raised a ton of money. Um, For some reason, I I was thinking Cards Against Humanity was like a Kickstarter, but I don't. I, I maybe they oh, sold, okay. but I don't. I don't know where Shuttered comes in. Let's go with Cards Against Humanity. Okay. That's a really good guess. Uh, I don't know if you put this clue in there, but I heard Ken say shuttered, which made me think of like a camera or a lens. And I can't remember when GoPro started, but it seems like it would fit to be a Kickstarter item. So we went GoPro. All right. I didn't intend to put a clue in that question. Uh, the answer is Pebble. Uh, the Pebble technology oh, yeah, company. Like the, uh, the smartwatch. Like the Fitbits, sort oh. of. They, yeah, the, the company sold to Fitbit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember them. All right. Question number two. The city of Glasgow is in Scotland. The town of New Glasgow is in what Canadian province? I had to make sure to put some CanCon in it. <laughs> Canadian content. All right. We will go ahead and lock in. What, what's your favorite province, Jeff? Um, well, I spent a lot of time in Ontario, so mm -hmm. it's pretty great. Although, having been in Alberta and uh, BC... I could uh, I could also say that those are quite lovely, but uh, I mean BC is British Columbia, so having a town like New Glasgow seems yeah, kind of weird. And you wouldn't want to put it on Prince Edward Island, right? Because wasn't right. Or wait, or was Edward a Ooh. king that was also in Scotland? I don't know. Uh, for some reason, I, I was drawn to the east, like Newfoundland or uh, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. or I kind of like Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, Sounds... maybe like New Scotland. That could, Nova Scotia? I don't know. Maybe it's like a Latinization yeah. of New Scotland. I mean, it's probably not, but I think we can go with it anyway. Well, I think we've convinced ourselves Nova Scotia <laughs> we're locking in with. That's some really good reasoning. I didn't even think about that. If it's right. No, it's not. You always say that, but it never is. <laughs> I couldn't remember all the provinces. I, I was just thinking uh, Ken had mentioned that he was originally from Newfoundland, and I just don't know what province it's in. I'm, I'm assuming it's Ontario, maybe, because it's... He's in Toronto now? I don't know, but we... It's also, I think, the highest populated 
province. So Is it? Okay. Not a bad guess. Uh, we just thought maybe it was near Newfoundland because Newfoundland to me sounds like it could be Scottish possibly. So we went with Ontario. Well, if uh, Glasgow is in Scotland, it would make sense for New Glasgow to be in New Scotland, and Nova Scotia is Latin for New Scotland. Oh, wow. Question three. What is the scholarly nickname of the punctuation mark that typically gets added immediately after the second last item in a list containing three or more, and before the coordinating conjunction, typically and or or? Oh, there is some debate amongst writers and editors on whether it is needed. Proponents assert that it helps avoid ambiguity. I can mm. uh, lock in, Matt. I'm a huge proponent of this. And uh, yeah. I've talked about it on a Patreon bonus. You can Big get it at patreon.com slash reality podcast. Yeah. If you want to hear all if about the know Oxford all about... <laughs> comma. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And how I believe that the Oxford comma is the way to go. I think so, too. All right. The answer is Oxford comma. I also am a proponent of the Oxford Town. Mm. Fine quality gentleman, indeed. Question number four. With over 2.6 million TV homes in its greater metropolitan area, which major American television market is the largest that does not have a team in each of the four major American sports leagues? It was ranked seventh on Nielsen's 2021 list of the largest U.S. designated market areas, up from 10th the year before. And for five bonus points, what market is ranked 69th and is the smallest designated market area to have one team in any of the four major U.S. sports leagues? We can discuss, Matt, but I think we both know both would be my guess. All right. Ken and I uh, had a discussion, and we feel pretty good about our answers, so we're going to lock in. Okay. So we both think that it's probably Columbus is the smallest, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Columbus having only the hockey team is is going to be 69th. Yeah. So for largest, we're kind of discussing. I think it's Houston. Um, I know you said Houston's the fourth largest city, right? But by t by TV market, um, because of you know if it's in the suburbs or depending on where oh, it is, and, it might. Yeah, you could have like I could see like DC with like Baltimore and DC and a couple other surrounding areas, maybe having a larger market. I could see that. I will, I will be swayed. So we can go with uh, Houston and Columbus. We too said Houston, but I'm pretty sure Columbus is like deceptively big. And we said Winnipeg. All right. Well, uh, I specifically mentioned uh, U.S. markets oh, US because markets. if we were counting, if we were counting uh, North America, then Toronto would actually be the answer because Toronto doesn't have an NFL team. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> the uh, the television market in Toronto is massive; it's like mm. just as big as Chicago. Fair enough. The answer I was looking for is Atlanta. Uh, so you guys said Houston. Uh, I wrote this question when before the 2021 list came in, and the answer was actually Houston at that point, and I thought maybe it would be too easy. Um, but apparently uh, Atlanta moved ahead of it, up to seventh. Uh, Houston is ranked eighth. Okay. Uh, and for the bonus, uh, the smallest market to have a team in a U.S. Uh, sports league um, is Green Bay. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, oh yeah, that's dumb. That makes sense. And Columbus oh, is no. deceptively big, as you mentioned. I'm just looking at my list now. It is 33rd. Question number five is another listener-supplied question, uh, again, supplied by my daughter. So it's, again, about animals. Perfect. What word do you get when you combine a word for a group of dolphins with a word for a group of falcons? It is something that should be familiar to this group. All right, we'll uh, we'll lock in. What's a group of dolphins? Are they a school? Uh, oh, right. No, I think school is reserved for fish. A pod? Oh, they're a pod. That's right. And I think that... <laughs> is it a podcast? It, it has to be. Okay. Yeah, podcast. We'll lock in podcast. Yeah, we knew the pod part. Uh, don't know about the cast part, but together, uh, podcast makes sense. Well, that's right. It's a podcast. I love it. That's Thanks fun. again. That's a fun question. Olivia, thank you. After five questions in the second round, it looks like there is a new leader. Team Ken Lander is at 95 points, but uh, slightly in the lead. Uh, team Christopher Lambert and Ernie with 105. Question number six. In 2007, Mongolia released a coin worth 500 Mongolian Tagrog, which had the image of what famous American on it? 
It included a button that, when pressed, played a short clip from a famous speech that he made in 1963. I have no idea. You just want to say Kennedy? Would he have been dead by then? It's it's on the cusp. I was thinking I'm pretty either... sure he was assassinated. In, you said 73 or 63? Sorry. 63. I is think it, he was assassinated in 63, so is it either, it's on the cusp. I was thinking either Kennedy or MLK. Let's go with MLK. Okay. So MLK does jump out at you because that's around, but I don't see the Mongolian connection. I mean, I don't I see also... a Mongolian connection anywhere. I'm looking right now because if, you know, the March on Washington, if that was 63, I have a dream is a pretty famous speech. Um, Martin Luther King seems like a safe answer. Okay. We will say Martin Luther King Jr. And the answer is John F. Kennedy. Oh, Ich bin ein Berliner. That's a shame. Hmm. Question number seven. According to NFL rules, players wearing numbers 10 to 19 are eligible to play for what four positions during a regular season game without having to report a temporary position change to the referees? They just changed this too. Is this, is this current rule, like going into the next season? Uh, no, I wasn't necessarily going for that. Okay. All right, we can lock in over here. Uh, I believe it's punters, kickers, quarterbacks, and wide receivers for now. And I think next year they opened that up to running backs too. And running backs used to have to be between 20 and 40. Okay. But I think it's possible they open that up. Um, and safeties, because I know um, Eddie Jackson's changing his number too. But I think I think for the purpose of this question, it's quarterbacks, running backs, punter, and kicker. Okay. We'll lock it in. We had the same reasoning. We could think of people at all those positions, and it made sense. So we went wide receiver, quarterback, punter, and uh, place kicker or kicker. Ooh, that's correct. I heard they were changing some of the rules. I knew they were uh, opening. I thought they were opening wide receivers up to be able to do one to yeah. one to nine or single digit numbers. I hadn't, I hadn't heard the rest. Yeah, it's anything goes now. <laughs> so yeah, I know Eddie Jackson. He's going to be doing his number Alabama four. number. Yeah, number four. Yeah. Question number eight. Though now somewhat antiquated due to the rise of digital music, the terms LP and EP are still commonly used when referring to albums. What do LP and EP stand for? All right, we will go ahead and lock in here. So the EP, I believe, is extended play. Uh, and I think L is long play. Does that make sense? You're saying one's extended and one is long? Yeah. I am almost 100% that LP is, it stands for long play. Okay. Uh, EP, I'm less sure, but I believe I've heard it as extended play. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I was, I was going the other way, thinking about records and saying like a limited pressing or something like that, but I, I'm inclined to follow you on this one, Matt. Okay. All right. We were, I was more sure about the extended play um, and you said long play too. Yeah, the reason I know that is because on Boston's uh, B side of four play long time, it's actually called long play four time. So that's where I got that from. So is we, it in four time? It is in four four time. There you go. The answer is long play and extended play. Uh, interestingly, the extended play is actually shorter than the long play. So it's all based on a, an SP, which is a single play. Uh, mm. And then so an extended play is a single that's a little bit longer. And then a long play is a full length album. All right, number nine. In the first line of the song, Nothing Compares to You, how much time has passed since whoever it was took their love away from Sinead O'Connor? Is this the one about the Pope? I don't know the song. Um, I think I know it, Matt. It's not about the Pope. She tore up a okay. picture of the Pope on SNL, and it's a cover of another artist's song, but I think we've got it. Okay. Very edgy. Yeah. Well, it, it was a Prince song. He wrote it. Um, how many years? I, I don't know the song that well. I don't know if he did it or if he wrote it for another artist. All right, let's say three. He did do a version of it. I was going to say three, actually, for some say random three. reason. Yeah, that makes like that makes like a, a, a decent amount of sense. Yeah, it's like a long time, but it's like... It's not extended, it's ex though. Acceptable. <laughs> it's acceptable. It's acceptable, but not acceptable. still be hung up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. I believe it's been seven hours and 16 days. That's it? If I remember right, Matt. Sounds like that, at least in my head. Mm -hmm. So do you want to lock that in? 
Oh, I don't care. Yeah, sure. Yep. Perfect. We'll lock it in. All right. It has been seven hours and 15 days. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love to see that. Yeah. Ah, the old um, shot in Freud strikes again. Uh, it's because it was a leap year. I knew it. <laughs> the song, it was written by Prince for a side project he had in 1985 or something called The Family, I think. Um, and they released it and then Sinead O'Connor came out with it after and it was a huge hit and then he released it again in 1993 or something oh, like interesting. that. Interesting. Okay. All right, question number 10. Um, what is the name of both the capital city of Guyana in South America and the capital city of the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean? They both have the same English sounding name, though technically one is one word and the other is two. No word on whether Patrick Ewing has ever visited either city. <laughs> Perfect. Got it, Matt. Yeah. Do you got it? I think so, but I'll let you I'll let you say. Okay. So the only thing that Patrick Ewing gets me to, he played for the Knicks, but he famously went to Georgetown, which are the Hoyas. So is, is, is Georgetown. That, just Georgetown, probably. Okay. All right. We'll lock in with Georgetown. Well, I was going to say Hoyaville. No. I think I Neil think, uh, was about to before I stopped him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to say La Jolla, but I was like, no, that's just LA. Yeah. So. Space Jam Mountain. Because uh, he was in Space Jam. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, we'll say we will say Georgetown as well. Georgetown is correct. Yep. Going into the final round, the scores are Ken Lander with 125 and uh, Christopher Lambert and Ernie with 135. So what are those categories, Ken? All right. The categories for the final round are number one, transactions in sports. Number two, economics. Number three, architecture. Number four, geography. And number five, Hollywood history. Ooh, they speak to me. All the wagers are now locked in. Let's hear those questions, Ken. All right. Final round, question number one, transactions in sports. John Madden, the namesake of the Madden NFL video game series, hosted Monday Night Football from 2000 to 2005 with partner Al Michaels. After the 2005 season, John Madden's contract was up, so he decided to move to NBC, which was starting to air Sunday Night Football in 2006. Al Michaels wanted to move with Madden, but was still under contract to ABC, ESPN. Disney owned ABC, agreed to let Michaels out of his contract to sign with NBC in exchange for the rights to an animated character created by Walt Disney himself in the 1920s. What was the name of the character whose rights were transferred from Universal to Disney in exchange for letting Al Michaels out of his contract, making him, to my knowledge, the only sports figure ever to be traded for a cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Number two, economics. Consider this scenario. In February 2007, Matt goes to see the movie Norbit during its opening weekend. What a 20 minutes into the movie's 103-minute runtime, he realizes that the movie is very, very bad. He decides to stay for the remaining 83 minutes because he does not want to waste the $5 he spent for the ticket. This is an example of what economic principle? That really happened to Matt, though. He definitely saw Norbit on opening weekend and stayed I'm the whole sure time. I'm pretty sure he mentioned it. I wanted to. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did, too. How are you doing? Yeah, I love Norbit. <laughs> <laughs> that part was not factual. That movie's good. All right. Number three, architecture. The word for what architectural features commonly carved from stone is derived from the French word for throat. Known to exist as far back as ancient Egypt, their primary purpose is to siphon water away from a structure. They became a fixture of European architecture around the year 1200, where they also served a secondary purpose of warding off evil spirits. Number four, geography. In the final scenes of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana and his father finally tracked down the legendary Holy Grail in the Temple of the Sun, which they found in the city of Alexandretta, a real ancient city close to what is now is Kenderan in modern-day Turkey. The exterior scenes at the Temple of the Sun, however, were filmed at what UNESCO heritage site and in what current country is it located? Question five, Hollywood history. Actor James Dean died on September 30th, 1955, when he crashed his sport Porsche 550 Spider, nicknamed Little Bastard. While Dean died instantly, the car continued to cause havoc, including accidents, death, and even a fire to many people who encountered it or even pieces of it leading to what has become known as the Curse of Little Bastard. All of this could have been avoided, though, if Dean heeded the advice of a fellow actor. Seven days before the crash, after seeing Dean in the car outside a restaurant, 
What actor who would go on to become knighted in real life, as well as play a famous knight on screen, told Dean, if you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. All right, great questions here. We will be thinking about these for a little bit, and we'll be right back. All right, all the answers are now locked in for the final round. Before we throw it back to Ken, just wanted to say come join us over at the Crop and Discord where you can interact with other listeners. Ken is on Discord. We're recording on Discord right now, so there's lots of opportunity to talk to other members of the Crop and enjoy each other's company. Uh, and if you'd like to enjoy each other's company in the T-shirts or stickers or mugs that have our logo on it, you can go to TeePublic uh, to check out our store. You can either get there by going to trivialitypodcast.com and clicking merchandise, or you can just go to T Public and then type "Where is Triviality?" and I'm sure it'll pop up. It's not tested; it probably will. All right. Uh, question one: What animated characters' rights were traded back to the Walt Disney Company in exchange for letting Al Michaels out of his contract to go to NBC? We could not come up with a good answer for this one, but luckily we only wagered ten, and we said Donald Duck. Uh, we wagered 30 on this one. It's something that I had seen either on some YouTube channel or it was on an ESPN article, but I know that they traded him for uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. They really wanted that IP back. What the hell is Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? Well, no one knows because they did nothing with it. And the answer is Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Apparently they were quite happy to get the rights back. They had an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit day with a parade and balloons and stuff at uh, Disney headquarters. But yeah, I don't know what they did with it. I think he's in phase four of the MCU, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) So it just looks like Mickey Mouse, but with uh, blue pants and bigger, more oblong ears. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, question number two was economics. Uh, Consider this scenario in February 2007. Matt goes to see the movie Norbit during its opening weekend. 20 minutes into the movie's 103-minute runtime, he realizes that the movie is bad. He decides to stay for the remaining 83 minutes because he does not want to waste the $5 he spent for the ticket. This is an example of what economic principle? This is why the podcast is still going and why I think uh, some of you guys still listen to it. It's the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, We wagered uh, 30 points on this. And, you know, much like my uh, $30,000 degree, I got to use something with economics. And that's a sunk cost fallacy. Yeah, we wagered 10. Sunk cost fallacy is correct. Question three was in architecture. The word for what architectural features commonly carved from stone is derived from the French word for throat. Known to exist as far back as ancient Egypt, their primary purpose is to siphon water away from a structure. They became a fixture of European architecture around the year 1200, where they also served a secondary purpose of warding off evil spirits. Is, is gutter French? Gautier? Gautier, yeah. Yeah, for real? Yeah. It's where I lie. That's what we're saying. All right, we'll say ten, gutter. Ten points. Um, I think you're not too far off. We wagered 30 on this one. Uh, what's something you often do with uh, a sore throat, Neil? Maybe gargle? Lasage. Mm. Uh, I believe this is the gargoyle. Oh. Yes, the gargoyle is correct. They had gargoyles in Egypt? Yeah, those, those, they, they look different though. Those things that you were talking about that I said, oh, you're barking up the wrong tree, Neil. I thought I was on the right track. I just didn't know what they were called. I was thinking about the large guards, like the cat guards or whatever they are, the foxes. Why are are people always saying that you're barking up the wrong tree? No one ever says you're barking up the right tree. If you bark at me, Jeff, I'll say it's the right tree. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. Uh, Question four is in geography. The exterior scenes uh, from the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade were filmed at what UNESCO UNESCO heritage site and in what current country is it located? Yeah, I believe that is Petra Jordan and the inside uh, doesn't have the magic traps and I was disappointed. Yeah, Um, we also said uh, Petra, which I think is in Amman, Jordan, but we said Petra Jordan. Petra in Jordan is correct. And we wagered 10 on that one. We wagered 30. All right. And the last one, uh, what actor saw James Dean outside a restaurant uh, with his car and warned him that if he got in that car, he would be found dead in it by this time next week? And then he was. Now, now, do we think this actor actually pulled the Jedi mind trick on him and killed him? I think what happened is they were at a cafe 
He said, if you get in that car, you'll be dead next you'll, week. You'll get in the car and be dead next week. And then he was wearing a robe, and then it just disintegrated, and it just fell to the ground. So, so we Ewan went, McGregor. Ewan McGregor, right. We we went uh, for 30 points. We said uh, Sir Alec Guinness. Great. These aren't the breaks you're looking for. Uh, we also went with Alec Guinness. Only the best yeah, next year at Triviality. <laughs> Highbrow Entertainment. That's right. The answer is Alec Guinness. So when you said he played a knight, you meant a Jedi knight. That's right. Tricky. After the final round, uh, it looks like uh, Team Ken Lander just couldn't make up any ground. We ended with 155 points. But today's cream of the crop are Christopher Lambert and Ernie with 270 points. Congratulations. I'm talking all the way to the top. Yeah. I believe we've been beheaded. Yeah, we are beheaded. Does that happen in Highlander? I've never seen it. Yes. Yeah. We've, we've been beheaded. Does that make me the only one? I believe it does. Yes. No, it does. You are the, the Ken. Yeah, that's true. You are the one and true Ken. Yeah. I will see myself out. So we all bid adieu to Ken. Uh, cue Green Day song. Uh, Goodbye, folks. <laughs> A great game, Ken. Um, that was a lot of fun because we were neck and neck the entire time un until the final, basically. Uh, so wonderful questions. Some really cool facts that I never knew, like the rabbit, and there's a couple other ones that uh, were pretty fascinating. But um, thank you for writing the game today and also for including Olivia's questions as well. Well, thanks for having me. I had a fantastic time putting it together, and this was really fun. So uh, it's, uh, this is probably the closest I'm going to get to replacing Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. <laughs> Well, you're welcome back anytime, uh, and we, we certainly won't be, you know, giving an invitation to Aaron Rodgers to come on, so you can take his place at any time that you would like. I think he, he should be a guest host on Jeopardy, quite frankly. Ken? Yeah. yeah. I think so, too. Aaron Rodgers? No, no, no. Get rid of Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> he doesn't need anything else. He's, he can just, you know, sit on his money or something. But, uh, yeah, Ken should go on Jeopardy and host, for sure. We'll uh, start we'll, a petition. It worked for LeVar Burton. That's true. Yeah, everyone in the crop, get Ken on Jeopardy. Um, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Olivia, for your questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon, including Ken. You can join them at patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. For Ken, Jeff, Matt, Ken, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. All right. Question four. Uh, what C word? Uh, How what C dare word is you? <laughs> <laughs> Sir. <laughs> All right.